It is your hands that have fashioned us, O Lord. We are the sheep of your pasture, and everything we enjoy comes from your hand. You are the fount from whom all blessings flow. And we pray, O Lord, as you have made us according to your workmanship in creation, and as you have remade us, that you would continue to craft us after your own workmanship in Christ Jesus, making us renewed in him after a true knowledge of God created in righteousness and holiness. And we pray, O Lord, you would give proof of that, that you have formed us for yourself by causing us to show forth your praise in our lives and with our lips, especially tonight as we seek to worship you and we live daily from the grace of your abundance, your bounty given to us. Hear us as we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. We'll sing our uh, evening psalm tonight. It is uh, the psalm we sang this morning, the psalm of the month. It's Psalm 1, How Blessed the Man. Those three stanzas there you can find, number 1B. You can be seated. Coming a reading tonight of God's Word to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 to 15. It was said of John Calvin that in his uh, brief couple of years hiatus from Geneva, spending time with Martin Bootser in Strasbourg, that he returned to Geneva and he picked up his sermon series, right where he left off a couple of years before that. We haven't been gone for that long, but we were reading through 2 Corinthians, and could be wrong about this, but I believe this is where we left off in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. So we'll continue picking up there where we were. 2 Corinthians 11, we'll read verses 1 through 15. Here Paul is dealing with uh, those who would claim to be apostles but are false apostles, uh, the danger of false teachers, how they come in, and they are actually doing the work of Satan in their deception. You can find this on page 969 if you'd like to use the Pew Bible, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 1. This is God's Word. I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness. Do bear with me, for I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin uh, virgin to Christ. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, uh, 
or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. Indeed, I consider that I am not in the least inferior to these super apostles. Even if I am unskilled in speaking, I am not so in knowledge. Indeed, in every way we have made this plain to you in all things. Or did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted? Because I preach God's gospel to you free of charge. I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. And when I was with you and was in need, I did not burden anyone, for the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. So I refrained and will uh, will refrain from burdening you in any way. As the truth of Christ is in me, this boasting of mine will not be silenced in the regions of Achaia. And why? Because I do not love you? God knows I do. And what I'm doing I will continue to do in order to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim that in their boasted mission they work on the same terms as we do. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan himself disguises as an angel of light. So it is of no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. We'll turn uh, to 2 Timothy here momentarily. As we do, let's go to the Lord in prayer, ask his blessing upon the reading and preaching of his word. We come to you, O God, once again, the one who has breathed out all holy scripture. And as you have done so uh, for our learning, we pray that we would now be instructed by them, having read and preparing to read again and hearing your word proclaimed. May we hear your word and we read the Holy Scriptures, mark them, learn them, inwardly uh, digest them. That by patience and comfort of your word, we might embrace and ever hold fast what is our blessed hope, the eternal life that you've given to us, appearing in Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. As we said a moment ago, turn with me, please, to 2 Timothy chapter 1. We'll read there the first five verses. And let's stand again for this reading. God's holy word. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. Paul an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve as did my ancestors with a clear conscience as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure dwells in you as well. As far as the reading of God's word, you can be seated. Uh, You might wonder uh, why we are uh, beginning at 2 Timothy. Of course, 2 Timothy implies a 1 Timothy, just as this morning, unsinkable 2, as the name of a boat implies unsinkable 1. Uh, we did, actually, uh, several years ago, make our way through uh, 1 Timothy. It was at the very end of uh, the overlap of David Burke's uh, pastoral ministry here when I uh, first came on. and uh, So he and myself and Pastor Dan Clay met our way through 1 Timothy uh, in 2017. So here we are at long last coming to 2 Timothy. Uh, that's part of the method to the madness. The other is, is really just because uh, just having bought a number of commentaries on Isaiah uh, I looked on my shelf just to see what was available already and not in need of purchase. And uh, from that series, had some, had some works on the pastoral epistles. Um, that's not very spiritual, is it? Uh, but here we are. Uh, regardless of where we are in the scriptures, we are, uh, we, we are encountering God's word. Uh, tonight, what we'll do is uh, we, we do plan to, to make our way through this short letter, four chapters. Uh, we'll seek to tonight as we open the letter together, just introduce it, and then speak to these first five verses. Uh, It's widely held, by way of introduction to the letter itself, it's widely held that this was uh, Paul's last letter, uh, written sometime 
uh, maybe A.D. 64 to A.D. 65. Uh, he is imprisoned. Uh, it appears from his words that he does not expect to be released. He's ready to be offered as a drink offering, he says. Uh, the time of his departure is at hand, of course, the, meaning the departure, his departure from this life. He's finished the course. He's run the race. He's kept the faith. And so Paul is, is writing as a man, really, who's preparing to die. He's in prison, a distinct imprisonment from what we see at the end of uh, the book of Acts, which it, he was essentially on, on house arrest for a time and uh, apparently released and then imprisoned again. Uh, the early church historian Eusebius claims that Paul was martyred under the reign of Nero. Uh, Nero's uh, reign came to an end in A.D. 68, but persecution, intense persecution began around A.D. 64. So uh, 64, 65, 66, 67, somewhere around that time frame, 67 is when Paul is believed to, uh, to have died, and this puts that letter within that window. There are two main sections to the letter, aside from the introduction that we'll see this evening and the conclusion. Uh, Paul wants to do two main things. One, he wants to encourage Timothy in his calling as he perseveres through suffering. And then secondly, he wants to encourage Timothy again in how to deal with false teachers. False teachers, of course, were a perpetual concern in the early church. We see it essentially in all of the, the New Testament writings, and no less here. And so as many regard this to be Paul's last letter, they are in a sense for us, his last, uh, at least preserved words as we come to in Scripture. So we might ask questions like this. How will he go out? What will this dying man say? What will be his last words? And tonight, for our purposes, how will he begin these uh, last words? What we'll find in these opening verses uh, from Paul, the things he says and, and what he is doing, showing by example, is that those entrusted with the gospel should continue in thankful encouragement as they remember that God is faithful. Those entrusted with the gospel should continue in thankful encouragement as they remember that God is faithful. We'll seek to explore this theme under two points. Uh, the first will be found in the greeting of verses 1 and 2. Uh, we're going to call this Paul the entrusted. Uh, he is one who is entrusted by Christ and he is entrusting things to Timothy. Uh, so Paul the entrusted, and then in verses 3 to 5, as Paul writes directly uh, of Timothy's own uh, circumstances and what Paul remembers of Timothy, Paul the encourager. Paul the entrusted and Paul the encourager. Uh, so back to the greeting. Paul the entrusted. Paul is writing to Timothy. Uh, Timothy is, is a dear friend of Paul's. His affection, Paul's affection for Timothy is, is evident. Uh, but he doesn't begin this letter, as we might expect, informally to a friend. You know, it's, it's not, how's it going, Timmy? Um, it, rather, he, he begins it very formally. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. I don't text my wife, Josh, a minister of the gospel, right? Um, but he writes very formally to a dear friend, designating himself as, as an apostle because it, though th this is a close relationship, he is Christ's minister, his apostle, he has an authority to instruct Timothy. This letter is going to be filled with all sorts of imperatives, commands that Timothy is, is going to be expected to follow. And yet he is indeed a friend. And even more than a friend, if you look at the end of verse 2, or excuse me, the beginning of verse 2, as it's addressed to Timothy, it's Timothy, my beloved child. My beloved child. We might understand Paul to understand Timothy as a child in a number of ways. One, it could have been that Timothy, Paul is responsible, humanly speaking, for Timothy's conversion. That doesn't appear to be the case. When we, when we are introduced to Timothy in Acts 16, uh, we read of a, a Paul coming to Derby and Lystra, and there was a disciple there named Timothy. He was apparently already a disciple. Uh, a second way we might understand this is that Paul sort of uh, adopted him spiritually in order to disciple him. And then thirdly, we might understand this in, a, in this way, that uh, sort of a father-to-son relationship in the sense that a, a son learns the, the trade of his father as he becomes his father's apprentice, taking up uh, learning by uh, example, watching all that his, his father does to, to learn this trade. Probably something of those latter two is, is in mind when Timothy, uh, Paul calls Timothy his, his child. But he loved him, uh, loved him like a, be a beloved child, just as a Parents love their biological children with a natural affection. 
Paul has an affection for Timothy, like a father to a son, but it's an affection for the sake of their bonds in Christ. And so now as he greets Timothy, addressing him here, he, he blesses him, uh, really with, with everything that he will need to discharge his duty, to fulfill his calling. Verse 2, grace, mercy, and peace from uh, God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. Uh, Timothy will need grace uh, to uh, do what he's called to do. And grace is what we all need to do what we're called to do. It's, it's grace that brings us in. It's grace that enables us. It's grace that sees us through from beginning to end. Uh, Timothy was also a man, as we uh, gather, he had his own uh, personal uh, predispositions. Uh, there were inclinations uh, that we might consider as weaknesses in, in Timothy. He's, he, he's told not to let anyone despise him for his, his youth, uh, his other, uh, other weaknesses that we might uh, point out, but uh, those things need to be strengthened, and yet they, they are challenged by not just his internal predisposition, but external circumstances. He's dealing with false teachers, this is a great discouragement. There's the threat of, of persecution. This is a great uh, discouragement as well. It's reported that not only, of course, that Paul died as a martyr, but it's reported to us that, that Timothy died as a martyr in the streets of, of Ephesus. And so if he's going to persevere in the race, and he's going to continue, and he, he's not going to make shipwreck of his faith, uh, he's going to need mercy from the Lord as he encounters these circumstances. But then we also find that Paul blesses him with peace. He's going to have to know that he's serving as one who is at peace with God. He's going to uh, need to know the abiding peace of God in circumstances that may not be altogether peaceful. And these things, of course, come from where? Not from Paul directly, but, from, but through Paul, from the Lord, from God the Father and from Christ Jesus our Lord. What Timothy needs is to be found in Christ. What Timothy needs is supplied for him in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that shouldn't come to a surprise to us, though, because Paul speaks over and again that this being in Christ is, a, is, is Pauline language. Our, our union with Him and where we derive all these all of, of the saving benefits, we, we find them in our, our, by virtue of our faith union with Jesus Christ. And so Paul is an apostle by the will of God and according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus. Timothy can know that these things are of these resources are available to him in Christ because God has been faithful to, to bring about these things in Christ. All that God has intended for his people, all that he's promised for his people is fulfilled in Christ Jesus. All of the hope, the anticipation of the old covenant saints from Abraham uh, forward that Paul would, would know and, and the ancestors that, that he speaks of in, in verse 3. All of this is in verse 1 according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. That's where it finds its terminus. All the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ. I love that section at the, the end of uh, uh, book two of the Institutes. I was going to bring it up here and, and read from it, which I don't usually read lengthy quotations, so maybe it's a, a good thing. But essentially there, uh, Calvin writes that if we seek anything, it's to be in Christ, that we're to find it in no other quarter. If we want innocence, where do we look? We look to His virgin birth. If we need to know that we are freed from the guilt of the laws condemning us under the wrath and curse of God, we find that in Christ's death and His condemnation. If we need gifts, if we're seeking gifts of the Spirit, if we're seeking these graces that Timothy, where do we find them? We find them in Christ's anointing. I love how our book of church order speaks of how all the offices in the church come they find their source in Jesus Christ, the mediator, in his office as our prophet, priest, and king. We find this. Our salvation, our, our service is all to be wrapped up in Christ. If we need hope for uh, life beyond the grave, we find that in Christ's resurrection. If we need hope for acceptance with God, we find this in his ascension to the right hand of the Father, in his acceptance with the Father. If we need hope for the last day of judgment, it's in, in the promise that it's Christ our Lord and Savior who is the one who's coming to judge the world. All is to be found in Christ. All that Timothy needs is provided for him there. Well, Paul is an entrusted man, an apostle by the will of God, but he's leaving this deposit with Timothy. He is entrusting this uh, to him. We often refer to these letters as the pastoral epistles. 
And uh, that's a, a fitting title for them. Uh, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus. They're the only letters of Paul, uh, except for Philemon, that are not designated to churches, uh, but rather to individuals. And they're written uh, with uh, concerning matters of church leadership, organization, how the minister or the uh, bishop or the elder is to uh, conduct himself, uh, how he's to oversee the life and worship and doctrine of the church. And uh, Timothy was uh, being entrusted with what Paul was entrusting to him. Paul is a deputy of Christ, and, and men like Timothy and Titus were deputized by Paul uh, to go and, and to continue the ministry, and they themselves were to do the same. They were to seek to train faithful men who could themselves teach and train faithful men. And, and we find uh, great instruction uh, for ourselves in the life of the church today as we, as we continue in the ministry uh, of the gospel. Uh, Timothy was, uh, was a man who was uh, a bit mobile. Uh, he didn't have a settled ministry. He had been left in Ephesus, and perhaps he's still here. First Timothy tells us Paul left him in, in Ephesus as he went to Macedonia. Uh, Timothy was to put things in order as, just as, as Titus was commanded to in, in Crete. Uh, but Timothy bounced around quite a bit. He, he was uh, to, to pick up where the, the apost uh, apostolic ministry left off. Uh, he was in, told to do the work of an evangelist. Uh, but even though he bounced around some, we're not to think of evangelists quite in the way that we might think of it today. You know, the John Wesley on horseback or, or George Whitfield, uh, just itinerant preachers. The work of an evangelist was, was really this... Uh, 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 it was a gift of Christ, as we see in, in Ephesians chapter 4, along with apostles and, and pastors and teachers, evangelists as well. These were men, Timothy, doing the work of evan ev an evangelist. They were beginning a work where there was none. They were establishing it and bringing order to it here. And so as they do, as they receive instruction from the apostle, these things being entrusted to them, so also we gain great wisdom and help as we continue in the ministry of the church, and we seek to ourselves uh, to do the same, to pass these things on beyond our, our time. And that'll bring us now to uh, what Paul is doing here. We've seen Paul the entrusted. He is entrusted, and he's entrusting something to Timothy uh, as an apostle. Uh, but now we see Paul the encourager. Paul the encourager in verses 3 to 5. Well, here we have, as we said at the beginning, a man who really is coming to the end of his life. And what is his attitude as he begins this letter? Verse 3, I thank God. This is common with Paul's letters, but it's interesting to me that this is one of the first things he says in this last letter. I thank God. And we often think of what we want to be thought of in our old age. And some of you have attended the memorial service for Vicki Burke earlier this week, uh, and just the wonderful testimonies from her family. It's the kind of stuff you say, man, I, I really hope that those, uh, my children and those uh, grandchildren, those who have gone on, I hope they could say the, the same things. We want to be faithful. We want to be considered faithful, counted faithful. But I also hope to be thankful. Thankful. I, I don't want to become a bitter old man. <laughs> Paul was not. I've shared this with some of you, and it certainly gives me hope for myself because I see this in my own earthly father, a man who is now growing in age. He's recently retired in the last few years, and he's not able to do many of the things that I know he would have thought he would be able to do in his retirement. And if you know our family well enough, you know that involves the woods and the water, hunting and fishing. Uh, but because of uh, the health circumstances that led to his retirement, and then because of some other surrounding circumstances, he's, he's lost those opportunities. And now, um, as I visit him, I, I would somewhat maybe expect there to be a, a tinge of bitterness. And you see this sometimes, right? When, when people get to a place where they think, uh, you know, they, they, when they finally would get there, you know, whether it is graduation or marriage or that job, or vacation, or retirement, or, or whatever it is. And of course, it's never all that we had hoped it would be. Uh, but Dad isn't bitter. He is reflective. He's, he's thankful uh, for, uh, to the Lord, uh, truly, for all the, the time that the Lord has, has given him, not focused on, uh, on what could be, 
I mentioned this in, uh, around Thanksgiving, but uh, Thomas Goodwin sums up the Christian life in this way. He says it, it can all be summed up under the heading of thankfulness. Man's duty to God. That, that follows the structure of the Heidelberg Catechism. That we, we understand our guilt, we understand the grace of God, and then we respond in gratitude. So Paul, now, as he writes, he, he doesn't appear to be a bitter man. He's not bitter about his circumstances, his imprisonment. He's not uh, bitter about lost opportunities, even good ones, godly ones. What more he could do in service to Christ on earth. Now he writes as a man who's consigned to the will of God. And one of the first things he's, he speaks of is how thankful he is. I, I thank God whom I serve. And notice the context of his thankfulness. He says, I thank God as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. Timothy is involved in Paul's thankfulness. He thanks God as he prays for Timothy. And as Paul now comes to Timothy himself, he mentions uh, three times in these verses of things he remembers or he's reminded of. He'll, He'll say a fourth thing. In verse 6, that he wants Timothy to be reminded of. We'll, we'll get to, Lord willing, at another time. But here, three times he says there's something he remembers. He remembers, first of all, Timothy in his prayers. I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. Remember the exhortation from Paul to the Thessalonians. Pray without ceasing seems that Paul is a man who practices what he preaches. He says he's praying, he's remembered Timothy in his prayers constantly. Um, in the two main divisions of the day, Paul can be found praying. He's praying night and day. And as he prays, Timothy is often the subject of his prayers. This has got to be a great encouragement for Timothy. Would it be an encouragement for you to know that the Apostle Paul says, I'm praying for you regularly, night and day. Well, we know we could be even more encouraged, can't we? That our Lord Jesus Christ, right, that was... Uh, Robert Murray McShane said, how, how bold would I be? How assured would I be if I knew that Christ was praying for me in the next room, if I could hear him praying for me, interceding for me? But he says that this is exactly what is happening. It is the case. Christ, as our great high priest, is interceding for me now at the Father's right hand. But it's a great encouragement to know that the saints are praying for us. This is a commendable practice, not only, of course, to pray, with and for our fellow believers, but to encourage them by letting them know we have prayed for them. It is an encouragement to know that people are lifting you up to the throne of grace. And so he remembers Timothy in his prayers. And notice, as he prays, he's praying for Timothy. He's praying for one who is a minister of the gospel, one he is entrusting this ministry to. Paul's concern Though certainly we, we, it should be our concern, he demonstrates this. We, we certainly pray for physical, material concerns. Our, our chief concern is for the matters of the kingdom. Your kingdom come, O oh Lord, your will be done. Timothy's praying, or Paul rather, is praying for Timothy. The second thing he uh, speaks of remembering here is in verse 4, and that is Timothy's tears. As I remember your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. Apparently these tears have something to do with Paul and Timothy's departure. I remember your tears and I long to see you. Uh, Again, uh, Paul left Timothy. He tells him that I left you at Ephesus in order to go to Macedonia. Perhaps that was a tearful departure. So it may very well be that Timothy still remains at Ephesus. uh, But Paul longs to see him. He's, he's writing now to encourage this uh, colleague and, and protege of his, even though he is physically uh, separated from him, emotionally, mentally, in his, in his thoughts, spiritually, in his prayers, he is, he is remaining uh, there. And so he wants to do all he can to comfort him with the words that he gives, but he's also, also uh, hopeful for a reunion, a reunion that's going to lead to their mutual benefit, to comfort Timothy and to fill Paul with joy. Paul longs to see his dear, dear friend. And then there's a third thing that we find now that he's reminded of, and we find that in in verse 5, and that is of Timothy's faith, his sincere faith. I'm reminded of your 
sincere faith. The word sincere means genuine, of course, uh, without hypocrisy. That is a type of faith that Paul was sure that Timothy had. He'd worked alongside Timothy long enough. He had spent enough time with him to believe that Timothy was genuine, that he was a true follower of Christ. This was the same type of faith that Paul had. Because Paul says in verse 3 that he, he serves God with a clear conscience. You can only serve God with a clear conscience if your faith is sincere. That's important for us uh, to maintain a, a clear conscience. Man is, is not only uh, created, with a, he's not, only, not only is he self conscious as uh, opposed to other animated beings, that, that part of that is that he has a conscience. That's the place where we make moral judgments. It's, it's the place, uh, a part of our constitution is those made in, in God's image. The Apostle Paul writes that in uh, Romans how the, uh, even pagans demonstrate the, the law of God written upon their, their consciences when they do by nature the things that, that God requires in His law. They, they, they show there is an understanding of, of right and wrong. There is, uh, so the conscience is important. It's not uh, infallible, however. Conscience is something that can be strengthened. It's something that can uh, be softened or hardened. Something that, can, that needs to be trained in light of God's Word. We're even told it can be seared as with a hot iron. It can become uh, so calloused over, burnt over as it were, that it's impenetrable. It doesn't receive or consider truth. But as the conscience makes self-judgments, Paul says, I can serve God with a clear conscience. He's doing this because the God he serves is, is not some new God. It's not that he's abandoned the, the God of his fathers for the sake of this newcomer on the, uh, in the uh, line of gods. No, but he's serving the true and living God just as his ancestors did. But he's now serving in the fulfillment of these things. The hope and anticipation, as we saw in verse 1, the promise of life, the things that they hoped in, has come to fruition in Christ. And so he serves the Lord, not with a condemning conscience, but with a clear conscience. And he was reminded of Timothy and his sincere faith that he shares. So Paul and Timothy share a sincere faith. Paul shares this faith with his ancestors who went before him. But we're also told here that Timothy shares this sincere faith with his own ancestors, namely his immediate ancestors, this maternal line, his grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice. The same faith that was evident, present in them is now, Paul is sure, present in Timothy. In Acts 16, when we're introduced to Timothy, we're told uh, of his uh, lineage uh, very briefly, at least of his mother and father. His father was a Greek, presumably an unbeliever. But we're told his mother was a Jewess and she was a believer. That was Eunice, who we find here. But we find also his grandmother, likely his maternal grandmother, Lois, is mentioned along with Eunice as one who had a sincere faith. And so Timothy now, possessing this same faith, we, we see there is an unbroken line. Uh, Timothy has a godly heritage. Someone put it this way. Along with his mother's milk, Timothy sucked in godliness from uh, the time he was an infant. And so the, the genuine faith that he possessed has been passed down to him from his mother and from his grandmother. And this is a great reminder to us of the, the, the covenant household and the importance of uh, what our responsibility is in training up our children. Uh, many of us have influences out, outside of our, our own uh, homes, you know, whether it's uh, someone you look to, a historical figure from church history that you've greatly benefited from, whether it was uh, a friend or, or a mentor. I know that is the case for some of you, that you were brought to faith from, from uh, someone like that. We should be thankful for those as God puts them in our lives, instruments of His, His own mercy. But as appreciative as we are and, and, and should be, there is no greater influence than the, the one at home, the, the domestic uh, influence of the family, the household. 
This is one of the reasons why God says in Malachi that he, the purposes of procreation, purposes in marriage, in the covenant of marriage is to raise up a, a godly seed. And so there are great covenant privileges that come to us in a godly home, but we have to remember, as we sometimes say, that these things aren't uh, received merely through osmosis. Uh, with those privileges comes great responsibility. God has appointed means for us to come and to, uh, uh, to, come to embrace uh, all of our covenant privileges. And this comes namely through training, teaching, and example. So parents are instructed to instruct their own children in the word of the Lord, in the ways of the Lord. They are to live a godly example before them. And we can't expect that our children are going to take the Christian life seriously. They're going to take the worship of God seriously. We can't expect that they're going to... Uh, that they're going to long for the courts of the Lord if, if we ourselves are not present in the worship of our God, if we're not bringing them along uh, with us. We can't expect that they're going to, in turn, uh, train their own children in godliness and faith and worship in the pew and in the home. How can we expect them to do this if, if we are not? So faith is handed down through, uh, name, through primarily through this... Uh, covenant line, but it's, but it's handed down through the means of God's appointment. And if we would expect to be blessed in this way, then, then we have to be diligent and give a diligent attendance to the means of that deposit. You might think of a man who's, uh, he works hard, but he's barely getting by. Uh, each week he, he takes home his, his paycheck and he puts it in a safe, but he never deposits it. And then he looks on the back, and the business that he works for says, this is void after 90 days. He's got all these checks. He's never made a deposit. All this hard work, all these checks, and it's never done him any good. Well, this is what parents do if, if, if they neglect the means of God's appointment. They fail to make the deposit. In corporate, in family worship, in teaching, in, in godly example, we've been given great resources, great privileges. So we need to give a diligent attendance to these means. We also want to say something to the children as well, because children, it's a great privilege to be in the church, in a Christian home, but you also, you also have a responsibility that the faith of your parents, the, the God of your parents, needs to be your God as well. You need to embrace Him. You need to trust Him. You need to believe in Him. The promises that were given to you in your baptism, you must take hold of them. Take hold of Christ, even as he's placed his name upon you and put you in the household of faith. There's a great encouragement here for us. A great warning as well. Because if we don't grow up to embrace the God of our, the true and living God, the God of our, our fathers, then all that we have, all that the deposit that has been made will only in the end serve to condemn us. But as the author of Hebrews says, we hope for better things. We are hopeful for better things. As it was for Timothy, so may it be for us. So, those entrusted with the gospel should continue in thankful encouragement as they remember that God is faithful. God was faithful to bring about the promise of life in Christ Jesus in the fullness of time. God was faithful through the ancestors of Paul to to, to Paul himself, even though for a time he was uh, a a Pharisee and and, and even persecuted the church of God, though he says he he received grace, mercy, because he did it in ignorance. But also to Timothy. God has proven experientially in his own life. He's proven himself true in his faithfulness. Whenever we uh, consider the ongoing work of the gospel of the church, we could be greatly uh, discouraged as we, as we consider the uh, increasing hostility from the culture, the, uh, the, uh, what, the, what the world thinks uh, of the church, the, the place the church holds in the, in the court of public opinion. Uh, even if we look at the church itself, we see its impotence, we see unfaithfulness, we th- see things that, are grieve us, that, that grieve us, and we know that they, they grieve the Lord. We could be greatly discouraged, but could we not say the same for Paul and Timothy? Uh, Nero is on the throne. There is persecution. 
there are false teachers. Paul is in prison. Uh, Timothy himself uh, was in prison apparently for a while. At the end of Hebrews, we, we read of Timothy's release. And again, history tells us that both of them died as martyrs. They could be great, uh, greatly discouraged as well. But what do we find here? Not circle the wagons that this is uh, all that we've worked for is coming to an end. No, Paul writes with a thankful reflection. He writes in hope. He, he's continuing to be faithful, trusting the Lord because he knows that God is faithful. Well, like Paul, we'll, we'll all come to the end of our earthly pilgrimage. We'll come to the, the dissolving of this earthly tabernacle to take up our heavenly residence. And we are, we are all getting closer by the day. But like Paul, as we see him opening this letter, and as we'll see throughout this letter, especially at the end of this letter, let us strive to finish our race, to finish it well. And may the Lord grant us these blessings that he granted to Timothy. Grace, mercy, and peace. It's just as Paul was entrusted and entrusted his work beyond himself, as Timothy was to do the same, may we have such grace, mercy, and peace as we seek to pass the torch, consider our own limitations, hopeful with what the Lord will do beyond our time. Let's pray. Our God, now we commit ourselves to you, all that we've read and that we've heard tonight. Pray that you'll seal these words to our heart for your own glory and our good. As we ask these things now in Jesus' name, amen. We'll prepare now to sing our final hymn tonight. Fitting hymn as night has come. We'll sing number 159, Abide With Me. 159.
to go in peace and receive God's grace in the benediction, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.